Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Valhalla uh, Movement Podcast. We've got here as a guest today, Sylvia Bernstein, who is, I mean, uh, a specialist, if, if anything, and that's maybe not um, conducive enough to how really well-known she seems to be in the aquaponics world. And today we're going to talk a little bit about um, how aquaponics work. We're going to try and get down to whether or not this can really be used for the masses, whether this can really... Um, help people live more self-sustainably, whether this is a viable solution for the world, but really also figure out how it really works. I mean, there's a lot of people who throw this, this term around. There's a, a mass confusion as to what the difference between aquaponics is and hydroponics. Um, and people, you know, sometimes you say aquaponics and they're like, oh, are you guys going to grow uh, some weed or something? Or what are you growing? Tomatoes? What, what's happening? So um, welcome. Thank you. And uh, thank you for, uh, for coming uh, on to this podcast today. So uh, let's first start with a little bit of your background, who you are, and, um, and then go right into what, are, what is aquaponics? You know, everyone's talking about this, but what is it? Cool. Thank you for that. And I'm, I'm really excited to be here with you guys. What you're doing is, is really amazing stuff. So thanks for inviting me. No, I appreciate it. Um, so my background, my as I always like to say, my relevant background, because because you kind of get to be my age and you've done all sorts of weird stuff. But really, it's been since I joined a company called Aerobro International back in 2003. I was one of the first um, employees there, and Aerobro was a company, is a company that makes a little kitchen countertop garden called the the Aero Garden. And I joined them mostly focused in plant uh, technology. I developed the whole seed kit line, and I eventually became the vice president of new product development and marketing. Mm -hmm. and while I was at Aerobro, one of the things that we were really, uh, really looking for, it was sort of one of our holy grails, was finding an organic nutrient. This was a hydroponic garden. We were putting, we were asking our customers to put chemicals in every two weeks to keep the plants alive, and that was always a disconnect for those of us that were developing the product. You know, how how can you have food, a food growing system, on somebody's kitchen counter and be asking them to feed it chemicals every two weeks? So. In our pursuit of organic nutrients and in sort of keeping up with trade literature, we came across this, this funky thing called aquaponics. And this was probably in about 2006, 2007, around there. Mm -hmm. um, and my honest reaction when I first read about it was, you know, a lot of skepticism, right? This was one of these funky donkey things that people thought might work, but probably really didn't, mm -hmm. because plant nutrients need to be complicated. Um, I have my name on some patents around plant nutrients, and, and you know, it's big, hairy chemical formulas, and that's how it needs to be. But uh, fortunately, a friend of mine at work, the, the guy in the office next door, decided to build his own aquaponic system. And he did this in the basement of his house, and he, he kept showing me pictures, and he kept saying, you got to come see this thing because, you know, it's growing, it works. And so one day I finally decided to go see it. And, uh, you know, that day changed my life. I mean, I could not believe the, the jungle that was happening in this guy's basement wow. growing nothing but some scraggly fish that he had in a, a little tub. Um, and so I spent the rest of the summer, and I was still at Aerogrow, but I was trying to figure out, okay, I know that this is an amazing technology and I really want to dedicate myself to the promotion of it. How do I do that? Mm -hmm. And so I spent the summer really focusing on do I want to create a commercial farm okay. and grow produce and and really you know expand um, the knowledge base around this by by becoming a farmer. I reached the conclusion that that wasn't a good idea. Um, just one of those sort of self-observation things. I am not a farmer. Okay. I have the capability to be a farmer. Um, you know, the, the, the 24 hour, seven day a week nature of farming um, just, you know, wasn't my thing. But I do have a strong background in consumer gardening products. And so what I decided was really to focus on home and school gardening and taking what I had learned from AeroGrow and taking aquaponics and really trying to move that forward in North America 
the way that it was already happening in Australia, um, the Australian aquaponics movement, especially around home gardens, was really taking off at that time. Mm -hmm. So I decided at that point I founded the aquaponics source and our mission has really been to support and supply and educate home and school aquaponic gardeners in North America. Um, and we started that in, oh, officially in November of 2009, but our website wasn't out until May of 2010, and we kind of look at that as really our starting point. Great. So that's my background in all of this. Now, what was your other question? What is um, So just so people can look can go and follow along, her website is theaquaponicsource.com, so for people listening, you guys can browse through it and check it out while she talks. But... Um, the next question is, so what is aquaponics specifically? Like people have this idea that, okay, yes, there's fish that, that, that grow in, in a container and it, and it can be grown indoors. Like it could be kind of set up outdoors, I guess, if you wanted to. Um, and it's a controlled growing situation where people can, can grow their own food. Now, there's uh, sometimes maybe a misconception as to what food they can actually grow. There's possibly a misconception as to uh, how it works. And then there's a very big gray zone between what aquaponics is and what hydroponics is. So if you wanted to go into a little bit of what aquaponics is, what it's used for, and uh, what the difference is between hydroponics and aquaponics. Great. Okay. So the simplest definition of aquaponics is aquaponics is a constructed recirculating system between a, an aquaculture system Mm -hmm. uh, which can be as small as a 10-gallon fish tank or a huge um, recirculating aquaculture um, construction between that fish component and hydroponically grown plants, meaning in the sort of the high-level definition of hydroponics, which is soilless gardening. So you're growing without soil. Mm -hmm. uh, so you take the water between the fish system, recirculate it through the hydroponic grow beds or the, the soilless media, and then the water comes back into the fish system cleaned. Because what the plants do, well, the bacteria in the plants, the bac there's a bacteria in there that convert the ammonia-based waste from the fish into a plant nutrient, a complete plant food. The plants then take the food up, mostly in, in nitrate compounds, and then that water gets returned clean back to the fish. So the plants provide filtration, the fish provide food. Um, key to that definition are a couple of things. One is the notion of recirculation. Mm -hmm. You don't really have an aquaponic system if you're taking fish waste and putting it through a planting bed. Like a lot of people will take their aquarium water and water their house plants with it. That's great. That's a great source of nutrition for your plants. It's not aquaponics because the water isn't coming back. Mm -hmm. Other notion that's really key there is that this is an ecosystem. And we'll get into the differences between aquaponics and hydroponics. But one of them that, that I find the most exciting is the notion of sort of relative control. Mm -hmm. So in an aquaponic system, you're really partnering with Mother Nature and you're enabling the process. So you're, you're working in concert with nature. And that's, that's um, it's, it's sort of this, this very subtle difference, but it's about um, creating an environment that optimizes the natural components of the bacteria, the plants, and the fish, and setting it up so they can all do what they do naturally. Because of that, aquaponics tends to be a little harder to set up at the beginning than a hydroponic system because you're establishing all those natural elements. But in my experience, it's far easier to maintain because once you've got nature in balance, then by and large, you can sort of sit back and just sort of make sure things are okay, but let it all happen. Okay. The, the contrast to that is, is a, um, a hydroponic system, which is very human intensive. It's very chemical based, as, as I said before. So in a hydroponic system, you're adding chemicals, you're having to keep track of the, the relative levels of, um, 
uh, nutrients and minerals in there through something called electrical conductivity. Mm -hmm. They will get out of balance over time because there's not natural um, microbial activity and living elements that you have in aquaponics to sort of keep it in balance. So every two to three weeks, you actually need to get rid of all your nutrient solution and start over fresh. So much more intensive. The same thing with aquaculture, the other side of the equation. Very human intensive activity. They don't, because you're mechanically filtering out all of that fish waste mm -hmm. and chemically and biologically filtering it all out, the fish are completely dependent on the humans to be maintaining just the right level of um, uh, waste that's in their tanks. With aquaponics, sort of both those go away and Mother Nature steps in and really handles a lot of that for you. Yes. So that's that's you know one of the key. I, I, I mean, like I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure you guys you could talk about this forever, and I'm sure there's a whole yeah. bunch of, of variations and differences between the two. But I think that gives a very good general idea as to how it works, which is great because that's you know that's what people want to understand. Now, let's talk a little bit about the inputs that go into um, building an aquaponic system. Like what? What needs to come together? Like I, so obviously there's no there's no soil. We talked about that. So there's basically some kind of platform where these plants are growing. And then what kind of plants are growing here? You know, I mean, yeah. I've heard rumors that it's it's better to grow like leafy greens, like a spinach or a lettuce of some sort, and it's easier to grow something like that than like some big hardy tomato. Is it number one? Is that true? You know, is that something that, that, that is still valid or is valid in your mind, or have you had experiences that that prove otherwise? And number two, like what, what does somebody need to, to gather if they wanted to kind of uh, build something like this in, in, a, in a rough format? Sure. Yeah. Great. And I really appreciate you asking that question about the tomatoes because, boy, that's a rumor I'd love to just squash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I've heard, I've heard all kinds of things like that. And, and for, for a period of time, I mean, even myself, I was kind of believing that, you know, we're... Um, just to quickly to go into this, Valhalla is building an aquaponics greenhouse and we're in the process of doing this now. We've got a little bit delayed because of uh, the city permits and this kind of stuff. But one of the things that we've been talking about is, okay, what are we going to grow in this aquaponics system? And so I'd love to hear what success you've had because we've, we've kind of said, okay, maybe we're going to start with leafy greens, get a, you know, a better balance going with that, and then kind of move into trying different things, hardier things, uh, fruits and vegetables and that kind of stuff maybe. so. Well, it has everything to do with the type of aquaponic system that you are developing. Okay. So when, when people think about aquaponic systems, really it, the entire range of hydroponic systems is available to you and, and there's several, you know, NFT and, and vertical and media and, and all that is available to aquaponic gardeners. But by and large, people are doing two types. They're either doing what's called deep water culture or raft based, and you've probably seen the styrofoam rafts floating in channels, mm -hmm. or media based, or more and more people are doing a combination of the two. And I, I can tell you why that's actually a really good idea um, uh, once I, I finish with these other two explanations. Sure. With a raft based system, mm -hmm which is what mostly is being used in commercial growing, in part because it's highly efficient. Um, when you think about, you know, you, you plant a raft, you just fill in the plugs, you start the raft at one end of the channel, and as the plants grow, you push it to the other end, harvest out the other end, and, and you're good to go. But raft-based systems necessarily uh, filter out the, the solid waste from the fish, right? Mm -hmm. The reason why you need to do that is because otherwise, with the roots just hanging in water, the solid waste from the fish will actually coat the roots of the plants and eventually asphyxiate them, starve them of oxygen, okay? Yeah. So in raft-based systems, there's a whole mechanical filtration system set up at the front end of them. Because that solid waste is being removed from the system, you generally have lower levels of nutrients, especially mm -hmm. 
the, the fruiting, the, the nutrients that are important for fruiting, potassium, calcium, um, in a raft-based system. So because of that, whereas they are wonderful for growing your leafy greens mm -hmm. and fast-growing herbs, your, your you know, basil, that kind of thing, not great for growing your fruiting plants. And mm -hmm. that, I think, is where the rumor has come out that, that sort of that is what people envision as aquaponics, and it's sort of lumped that, well, aquaponics isn't great for growing, you know, fruiting plants, right? Mm -hmm. But there's this whole other style of growing, which is called media-based growing. And that's what was really popularized by the Australians, who were focused more on home-based gardening. Media is much more appropriate for home-based gardeners for a few reasons. One is that you get rid of all that mechanical filtration up front. And the reason for that, the reason why you can get, get away with that, is because in media-based systems, we take all that solid waste and just throw it into the media beds. Mm -hmm. In those media beds is, is bacteria, specifically heterotrophic bacteria, that breaks that solid waste down. Plus, we advocate putting composting redworms in your, your media beds that are also breaking that solid waste down, making it available to the plants. So in a media bed, not only do I have the support for big old you know, tomato plants and, and um, peppers and corn and, mm -hmm. and all those crazy high nutrient plants, um, but I've got the support and I've got the nutrients to be able to handle it. So because you don't have the extra filtration, you don't have that extra cost, you don't have to spend the time cleaning out those filters, um, raft-based systems are, are much more intensive to, to maintain than media. Um, and, you know, I, I keep everything within the system, so I'm not subtracting anything. The one downside to media-based systems is because of this, there's a bit of a price to pay. I can't stock my fish tanks as high as I can if I were mechanically removing the waste. Okay. So okay. now what people are starting to do is combine the two. Okay. So if you combine the two, imagine treating your media beds as your mechanical filter. Mm -hmm. Now my, my water goes through my media beds, then it hits my raft beds with the solid waste mostly removed, and I can grow both kinds of plants. And that's that's the way that a lot of people are moving. But in a media-based system, you asked, you know, what can and can't you grow? Oh my God! I mean, I, it, we're constantly experimenting with stuff. And in my backyard right now, and I, I wish I could put up pictures here. Well, um, we can, but it, uh, later on you can send me some pictures if you want and I'll link, I'll link them and I'll, I'll, I'll link that. them with us. Yeah, we will, yes. yes. Because in our um, uh, media-based system right now, we've got like nine foot stocks of corn. I mean, we have wow. the most huge plants you've ever seen. In the greenhouse, we've got a, dwar a Meyer lemon tree happening. Really? Um, uh, oh, yeah, we've, we've got all sorts of fruiting plants, we've grown strawberries, we've, you know, you name it, we've grown it in a media-based system. There's only two exceptions to that. One is any plant that is looking for a pH that's very far off neutral. Okay. So aquaponic systems like to be at about neutral. Mm -hmm. Blueberries, as sort of the extreme there, like to be more at about 4.5 to 5 pH, right? Yeah. They're be real happy in an aquaponic system. Understood, okay. The other one is any plant that likes to be sort of deeply subterranean. Okay. So potatoes, onions, not so much. But if it's a bulbing plant, like a beet or a radish, they okay. do great because they just kind of push themselves up and out. So those are the only limits that I know of in, in an aquaponic system. Wow. Okay. I mean, I think you just, you really, you said it yourself. I mean, you squashed the, the rumors <laughs> behind I it. I appreciate the platform to do that because it just drives me nuts when I hear that aquaponic systems can only grow lettuce. And I got to tell you, you just got to take one look at my backyard <laughs> to know that that's just not true. Yeah. No, I mean, it, I think... I think that's the that's where we're at now in terms of like the general population and what they understand about aquaponics. The, the first thing that comes up every time I mention aquaponics to anybody is, oh well, you guys are gonna grow lettuce. Like how are you gonna how are you gonna eat off that? How are you gonna live off that? And I'm like, 
Well, I mean, first of all, let us build it and let me try some stuff first. Because, you know, okay, yes, we've heard these rumors and we've heard all this stuff. But number one, we haven't tried it yet, so I don't know. I'm not going to tell you I'm going to live off this greenhouse we're going to build tomorrow. But I think there is a possibility of it being done. You know, I've seen videos, seen your videos of, of, of tomatoes and things growing and all kinds of stuff. So, yeah, this misconception is really bogging down this technology. But I think this technology merits a very serious look by not only people at their home and in their backyards and this kind of stuff, but even even on a, on a large scale. And that's kind of what I want to go into a little bit um, with you is, you know, we've, we've heard about these systems, we've heard about, you know, GMO farming and, and, and with how it's necessary for us to be able to feed our population and that we have to ship food from around the world to, to be able to feed the, the people um, here in America and here in, you know, wherever it is in the Western societies, I guess. And, I mean, you and I both know that this, that's completely inefficient. I mean, how does it make sense that we're going to grow something all the way in, I don't know, Brazil and then ship it by boat or by train or by air or whatever it is? I mean, it just, it just doesn't make sense. And this is what a lot of people are taking interest in today and a lot of people follow Valhalla and I'm sure yourself because of this, because we want to empower ourselves to be able to do this. So I'd like to talk a little bit about who could set this up. How is this something that we could do in our in our backyards like I mean you talked about doing this in your backyard but is it because you have some kind of special backyard Do you have a big plot of land that all of a sudden you could do something like this and are you or do you think it's feasible to grow enough food for a family to be able to to to, to survive let's say okay maybe not to survive in the same way that it's as comfortable as maybe today where you can have abundance of foods and every type of food from around the world but can somebody live off of this in the worst case scenario um, if they were to set up their own aquaponics system. Um, and uh, to answer that question, I'll, I'll start with that and sort of work backwards sure. through some of the things that you've introduced here. Yeah. Um, is it possible for a family to survive off of aquaponics? Um, theoretically, it's possible. What people aren't doing a lot of in aquaponics is growing your big grain crops, mm -hmm. right? So, yes, you've got protein and you've got vegetable, but you don't really have the grain side of the equation. So if you're interested in, in eating breads and grains and potatoes and onions and that kind of thing, um, could you live? Yes. Would you be happy living without those other things? You know, that's, that's a more esoteric question, I guess. Um, but you absolutely can. You can grow enough produce and fish to support a family, for sure, mm -hmm. uh, no doubt about that. And just a quick question before you continue. So, yeah. I mean, I guess, yeah, I mean, I think your answer, it says it all. I mean, yeah, would you be happy living off just these things? Yeah, probably eventually you get sick of it, but I mean, hopefully in this scenario, people can grow during their summer seasons and that kind of stuff too, right? I mean, technically right. they can have a, a regular garden as well, which they right. can make preservatives out of and all that kind of stuff. So it can probably get them through the winter eating some of these foods. But you, you mentioned fish and we actually haven't talked about what kind of fish are in these tanks. Like what, are, what, what am I eating here? Am I eating, am I eating like fresh trout? Is it salmon? Is it tilapia? I mean, I, I know, I know a little bit about it, but uh, maybe some of our viewers would like to know a little bit more about that. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So I'll, I'll talk about fish for a little bit. Yeah. Just for a second. Then we'll go into those other questions a little bit. Um, okay. Great. Yeah. Um, with an aquaponic system, you can grow any kind of freshwater fish. Uh, you have to pay some attention to things like water temperature and, and are they carnivorous or not as far as if you're combining fish. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, people are growing tilapia, trout certainly, um, bass, perch, uh, freshwater crayfish. Um, all sorts of crazy things are being grown in aquaponic systems. So uh, the, you know, the only limits really are, are around those sort of environmental limits with the fish themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I have grown catfish, bluegill, tilapia, and trout um, in my systems, all quite successfully and up to plate size. And, uh, you know, it's great stuff. Um, so nothing is sort of fresher or 
here in my long guy. <laughs> <laughs> Solid. But, you know, nothing, I mean, fresh is amazing. And even something that as simple as a tilapia, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I kind of think of tilapia, as, you know, eh, eh, it's, you know, it's, it's not a big deal fish. Part of that is because 90% of the tilapia in this country comes from China and it's raised in really questionable conditions. Mm -hmm. It's been ash frozen and shipped all the way across the world, right? To, to your point earlier about, you know, can we really get away with all this movement of food in the world? But when you grow a tilapia yourself in your backyard and you harvest it, you know what that fish was fed, you know the conditions that it grew up in, you know the conditions that it was harvested in and, and how humanely or, or hopefully not inhumanely that was done. And you know that you know, 10 minutes later, that guy is on your plate. The flavor is nothing short of amazing. And the first time that I ever had a tilapia out of one of my tanks, you know, once I, I got over the whole notion of sort of harvesting one of my pets, um, you know, it, it the, the, the flavor difference between that and the frozen stuff you get from China the friend that I was with was actually the guy that got me into the whole aquaponic thing in the first place. And we sort of ceremoniously um, harvested our first tilapia together. And he put it really well. He said, the flavor difference is like the difference between a store-bought tomato and a garden fresh tomato. It's that different. So amazing. I, I, I have to believe you on this. I, I have not actually tried um, tilapia that's been grown in an aquaponic system, but I don't doubt that exactly what you just said at store bought the difference between a store bought tomato and a fresh garden tomato. There are so many people out there who are going to be listening to this that have very rarely tasted that serious difference. And I'm not to say that I taste it all the time either. You know, I buy tomatoes and all this stuff too right now. But the, the good idea is to kind of move away from that slowly but surely, and it's a process. Um, but I, I have to believe that there is a very significant difference in terms of taste when something was kind of, you know, served or there was a swimming 10 minutes earlier and now all of a sudden is, is on your plate and, and kind of going and being cooked on your barbecue or wherever it is. I mean, the, the, the flavor difference of that has to be amazing. Now, yeah. are you guys feeding the fish in this aquaponic system? How, where are they, like I understand that they, there's a system that they, they, they kind of feed each other. But is there extra, like, is there an extra input of food that you guys are putting into these mm -hmm. systems so that these fish eat? And, um, you know, what is that, how does that make a difference in terms of, like, the taste and, and whatnot? And what are you feeding these fish as well? Um, we actually have two different kinds of food, and, and we sell this through the aquaponics source. Um, one is a straight-up commercial, commercially formulated food. Um, there have been decades of science that's gone into formulating these foods for omnivorous and carnivorous fish being held in captivity. Mm -hmm. um, there's some challenges with that food, definitely from an environmental standpoint, uh, chief among them being the source of protein. Mm -hmm. uh, most commercial food is getting most of their protein from fish meal, mm -hmm. which is ironic that we are, we're, um, doing this great thing by not harvesting more fish from the ocean, by growing fish in recirculating systems on the land, closer to urban centers and, and more localized and all that, and yet we're going out to the ocean to harvest the fish, to feed the fish that we're growing on land. So we really need to be getting away from that, and the aquaculture industry is working very hard on doing that with, with a lot of success actually and I suspect that fish meal as an, a major input to fish food is going to start going away over the next few years mm -hmm. but fact is that most fish food has fish meal in it now there's also an organic fish food that we carry um, we're one of the very few companies that actually do and that food has no it's it's strictly organic there's no GMO ingredients there's no uh, fish meal in there. It's been entirely formulated using all sorts of complicated lipids and, and stuff that I can't even begin to understand. Um, but basically, they've been able to replicate the profile that the fish need without these other inputs. So the downside there is it's definitely more expensive, you know, as we all know, trying to get a hold of 
GM grains these days is, is expensive. Mm -hmm. They're not widely available. So I, I feed my fish those two things. Now you can also be feeding, um, you can grow some of the food that you can feed your fish too. Mm -hmm. uh, people are growing stuff like duckweed, uh, water lettuce, uh, worms. Um, fish love worms, obviously. Uh, and I've been out fishing with a hook. Uh, <laughs> black soldier fly larva. It's great for fish, great for chickens. So if you're lucky enough to be in an environment where you have native black soldier fly, uh, that's an interesting thing to do. So there's lots of things that you can do to at least reduce the amount of um, uh, sort of commercially formulated feed. I always sort of caution people, though, sort of two things that you want to take into consideration. One is that we are the guardians of these fish. You know, you're, you're growing an animal to consume, but you want to make sure that it has a, a healthy life until you get there. And so you don't want to raise your fish in, in, with food like a single source of food, like just feed it duckweed for its entire life because it's going to have all sorts of health problems. Uh, these are most of the fish that we're looking at are omnivorous creatures, mm -hmm. um, and they need a balanced diet. Um, so for the health of the fish and the health of your plants, when you think about it, the only way that aquaponics works is if you get a wide variety of, of nutrients coming out of the back end of those fish, right? And the only way that you're going to get those nutrients coming out of the back end is if you put a wide variety of nutrients in the front end. So mm -hmm. plants are only going to be healthy and get the nutrients that they need if the fish is getting the, are getting the nutrients that they need. So I really advocate a combination of the two. Almost think of the commercially um, developed food as a vitamin that makes sure that the fish are getting the nutrients that they need and then supplement that with food that you grow yourself. Okay, so yeah, a balanced, I mean, not surprised by the answer, a balanced approach, I mean, having a variety of food that the fish would eat and then, and then this is being applied, so just to quickly answer that, this is really being applied as an external source to the, the ecosystem that is an aquaponic culture. Yes, if, if you really wanted to look at sort of systems thinking and are you closing the loop, there's a few things that, that make this not a completely closed loop system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One is that somehow you need an input, which is the feed for the fish. The second is that you will need to replace some water, probably. I've heard of people developing very specialized greenhouses where they're recapturing all the water that transpires from the plants. and. But I think that if you're actually removing plants from the system, you're probably removing the water that's contained in those plants. So at some point, you're going to have to add water. Yeah. And then there's power. And yeah. you will need some source of power for an aquaponic system. Because of the recirculating nature, you have to take the water and lift it in order to, to get it to recirculate. Yeah. So a typically, pump system of some sort. Pump, but pumps are being being driven off of um, solar, uh, wind. You know, there's there's lots of innovative things that you can do to power a pump that's not necessarily on the grid. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, that's that's exactly what we're setting out to prove with the Valhalla is that we're trying to build uh, Earthship inspired aquaponic system greenhouse where we're going to have some stuff that's planted directly into the ground, kind of like with earth and almost like garden beds. And then the kind of the other half of the greenhouse is going to be, um, ide ideally, we're actually doing both. We're going to do a floating system and then a media system where we're going to see the difference of what we can grow and do all these tests and really kind of um, take it to the next level and see what that, all of that is going to yield. But we're planning on powering it basically mainly out of solar panels. Beautiful. You know, all, of it, all of it is going to have, we're going to have like six solar panels. They're going to power a pump outside for uh, during the summer months. We're going to have like a uh, an outdoor, I guess, aquaponic system, if you want to say it. I mean, it's basically an ecosystem. It's not an aquaponic system at that point um, with, you know, cascading water and all this kind of stuff. And then when that closes down and, and this, you know, we can't really fish out of that and we can't use that in the, in the winter, um, we're going to try and replicate that indoors in this greenhouse and then keep it going. So, yeah, I mean... So you said power, water, 
and fish feed, I guess, is the, the three main things that are, are inputs. And if anything goes wrong, I'm assuming there's other chemicals and things that you guys use to, um, to kind of balance the pH potentially and stuff as well. Mm. Yeah, and there is there are um, some things that you do need to do with the pH for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned that we like a pH of neutral. What happens in the aquaponic cycle is you've got nitrifying bacteria that are that convert the ammonia based fish waste into nitrate based plant food. Mm -hmm. That an output of that nitrification process is nitric acid, and you hear the word acid, what that's doing is ultimately driving down your pH. Mm -hmm. So in order to keep that balance and to keep things at a seven, what what we advocate doing, and, and this is from you know many others, uh, good work around this area, um, is adding a combination of um, calcium carbonate and potassium carbonate. Uh, both of those are on the OMRI list for organically certified farms, so they are um, an organic ingredient. Their calcium carbonate is just seashells or eggshells that have been ground up finely. Um, so you add that in order to buffer up or push up your pH. So you do have to do that. Um, once you've been doing that for a while, though, you actually find that you develop what's called a buffer in your system. And it tends to stay pretty steady at seven. You've got to, you know, push it up once in a while, but it's it's not as bad as it sounds. Mm -hmm. The that actually addresses two nutrients that can get um, uh, depleted in an aquaponic system, depending on what you're growing, and that's calcium and potassium. Um, if you're growing a lot of fruiting plants, um, they will be sucking up that potassium and calcium. And, you know, pulling that out of the system, it needs to be replenished. Well, we're lucky enough to be replenishing that in the same way that we're pushing up pH. So it all works out pretty well. Mm -hmm. The third nutrient that can get depleted in an aquaponic system is iron. Uh, again, that depends on what the iron input is into your system, meaning your fish food. If you've got a fish food that has um, iron in it mm -hmm. uh, and you know, then, then you might be fine, but it also has to do with how the iron's being pulled out at the other end. So if you're growing a lot of plants that take up a lot of iron, you know, think Popeye and his spinach that <laughs> had a lot of iron in it, right? Mm -hmm. Then you're pulling a lot of iron out. So depending on how much iron you're sending in and how much iron you're sending out, you might end up in an iron deficient situation as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you need to keep an eye on that. But other than that, we really don't do any additives of uh, nutrients or anything along those lines in, in aquaponics. Great. So I, I, know, I really want to get to this, like whether this is, you know, uh, some kind of solution for, for many people in suburban areas and even urban areas and that kind of stuff. But a question occurs to me, and I know this question is burning inside of everyone, and they want to know, <laughs> Is it, like, can they save money growing an, their own food in an aquaponic system? Like, does it, with all these inputs, power and all these things, is it, you know, all, the, and there's effort too, right? There's a certain amount of time, and I guess there is a, there is a benefit there. There's unquantifiable uh, benefits that come from eating healthier and eating uh, something that you produce yourself and that kind of stuff. All that aside, would you, if you grow an aquaponic system, do you save money? Does that tomato or does that lettuce cost you less um, if you wanted to get a comparison side by side, um, you know, products? Let's say so comparing to GMO products, but also comparing to organic products. What would what is your take on that? Um, boy, GMO products and organic products. Um, and actually, to the best of my knowledge, I'm not sure that there are GM tomatoes out there yet. Um, so I, I, I can't even really speak to that. It more maybe conventional and organic. Okay. Um, the can you save money? The short answer is yes, with a whole lot of caveats. And here are the caveats. 
where you're going to sink money into an aquaponics system is really in three areas. The first is going to be your setup. Mm -hmm. And you can set up aquaponic systems really inexpensively using recycled materials or, um, you know, scavenged materials. Um, a lot of people are working with something called an IBC tote these days. Uh, stands for intermediate bulk container. It's, it's these uh, shipping containers that have metal frames on them. So if you're doing uh, scavenging or using containers that you already have, and you're building it yourself, then you could probably save a lot of money at the front end. If you're, if it's important what it looks like, or if it's important that it be um, uh, not take up a lot of your time or whatever, if you if you have other priorities other than saving money, mm -hmm. then you're going to want to go with with a system that's been designed by a professional. Mm -hmm. But saving money is your primary goal, then you can absolutely do that at the front end. But you've got to you've got to pay attention to that. The next place where you can sink a lot of money into an aquaponic system is in the energy inputs. Mm -hmm. um, and that has everything to do with heating the water or heating the system. So when you're designing your system, uh, you know, you're, you're putting your system in an Earthship greenhouse. Now, Earthships are known for being very energy efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very um, uh, climate uh, efficient. And so that's great. Um, my greenhouse, in contrast, <laughs> um, was on our property when we bought it in 2000, in 1999. At that point, it was 15 years old. Mm -hmm. It is single pane glass, mm -hmm. which is the worst thing that you can build a greenhouse out of, believe me. So <laughs> <laughs> that's the other side of the spectrum. And um, I would never do that again. But there are really, really um, great greenhouse designs out now that are meant to be very energy efficient. They take advantage of the, your particular environment in your particular area and the angle of the sun and, and blah, blah, blah. So if you pay a lot of attention to what it is you're putting your aquaponic system in mm -hmm. and you pay attention to the type of fish that you're growing, mm -hmm. right? So if you're growing a tropical fish, like a tilapia, you're going to need to make sure that that water stays warm in the winter. Mm -hmm. uh, so through your choice of fish, your choice of plants, again, a tomato likes a warmer environment. So, you know, the, that's that goes into the equation. Um, and your structure that you're putting it in, mm -hmm. uh, then you can really reduce those inputs. And the third place where you're going to spend money is with the fish food, as, as we were already talking. So if you grow some of your own fish food and you're actually supplementing that, um, or frankly, if, if you decide not to go with an organic food and you go with, with a straight up food, um, then you're going to save some real money. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if all of those things are optimized, then I believe you can get pretty close to what you would be paying for organic uh, produce there. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, all right. So, I, I totally understand. So, given the fact that if somebody were to do this, and, and this is, I think, this is to me the biggest challenge that we have with aquaponic systems and going green, is there's two, there's two main challenges. Number one is what we just talked about. The does it save people money? Like, why is somebody going to take on this, this, I don't want to say a headache because there's a joy that comes out of it, but to some, to some people, the average person who goes to their nine to five and does all this stuff, they don't want to, they don't want to think too much about this. They don't want to spend too much time um, growing their own food and all this kind of stuff. So they kind of want it to be automated, right? As much as possible. Obviously, there's always maintenance to everything and they, I think everyone understands that, but generally they would want something to be automated. And that's the, that's the thing that they want them to save money because they would do it, in my opinion, if it saved them money. That's mm -hmm. number one. Or the other thing they would do it for is that this kind of intangible thing, which is they believe that this is a better system. They believe in kind of, uh, you know, the fact that global warming is an issue and, and, and that we really kind of have to start producing locally and that we have to change our ways, as, as I would believe and, and many of the listeners today would believe. The reality is, however, that they also don't have enough information. 
there is a diff, there's a gap between people's understanding of what aquaponics is or, or any green technology and it being applied into their real life. They want to know, like, how can I truthfully get this done? How can I really set this up in my in my backyard or in my uh, condo in, in the middle of uh, downtown urban area kind of thing? That's what I want to know about now. Is this something to you that really can take off? The can is one question, and then the other question is, will it? How many people do you think are going to get into aquaponics system? How many businesses are going to pick are going to start sprouting up where food is grown more locally in these aquaponics systems? And um, what are the challenges in your mind? You know, those are the challenges in my mind: the costs and the and and the the ability to the, the knowledge gap, I guess. But what do you think about that? Uh, it's actually a question that I think about a lot. Um, what frightens me a bit is um, there's sort of a, a um, there's a real cost and a real benefit to the internet sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of information out there right now and it's all free. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is some, I, I would argue majority of it, is bad information or it's conflicting information. And what happens is that, that uh, somebody getting into this feels that they can learn all they need to know by spending a weekend watching YouTube videos. <laughs> and the problem is, unless you've got some way of filtering out the good information from the bad, um, and when things conflict, you know, what, what is it that you should be listening to versus not, um, then you're going to go down the wrong path. You're going to spend a bunch of money and you're going to get really frustrated and say, oh, this aquaponics crap just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, and as somebody who is devoting their lives to the promotion of this, this growing technology, that really, it, it scares and frustrates me at the same time because if aquaponics is done right, you know, you can have a greenhouse full of tomatoes and nine foot high corn stalks and it's it's an amazing technology mm -hmm. but it's got to be done right and it's fairly simple but again you've got to set it up correctly the ratios need to be right etc cetera, etc cetera. so to that end and and this is not a plug right. believe me but this no, is please this is why i wrote the book. Um, I wrote a book called Aquaponic Gardening two and a half years ago. Um, that my whole goal was not that I was coming up with unique information. What I wanted the book to be is was really a filter of the information that was out there. And I worked with the advice of, of some people that I, I respected and trusted a lot, and I used my own systems as sort of a, you know, a truth detector here. Mm -hmm. um, and I wrote that book that if you follow these steps, then you will have success in, in aquaponics. And it's sold over 40,000 copies now, and there's a lot of successful gardeners out there that have used those steps to develop their systems. So I guess what I'm saying is that if you find somebody that, that you trust, who's written a comprehensive or done, you know, we've done an online course as well that, that has a lot of the same, that's meant to sort of a companion to the book. Um, so a video source that you trust, um, but don't go after it with sort of this scatter shot of, I'm just going to do a, you know, a search in YouTube for aquaponics and see what comes up and trust it all. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I think that once people get to that point of really getting to the truth and the, the way to set up a system that's going to work, then they're going to have lots of success and have lots of fun. Um, going back to your question about the cost, that there really is two things that aquaponics need to needs to get over, um, and I agree completely with your assessment. Um, the cost, I think we've, we've already addressed. Um, and, and really there is, you know, I, I have a book on my bookshelf, I, I forget the number in the front, but it's like the $10,000 tomato or the $200 tomato or something like that. That's all about sort of the joy of gardening that sometimes we can sort of get a little out of control with our systems and it's not about the, the cost sometimes. 
Um, but I think that there, you could also look at the cost of um, sort of supporting the current agricultural system without having your own personal backup. You know, there's a real cost to our health of that. And there's a, the flip side of that is there's a real joy of being able to have that, that fish especially, which is the thing that aquaponics does so uniquely, being able to have that fish that you can pull out of your, your garage, your basement, your back door, backyard greenhouse um, and have on your plate within 10 minutes. And, and how do you put a price tag on that? You know, mm-hmm. is that net net, is that going to be cheaper than what I can get from Safeway? I don't know, you know, you'd really have to run a full blown set of inputs on it. But is that really the point? Yeah. You know, it's the fact that you are more food independent, you're, you're giving yourself and your family a much more, uh, varied interesting diet if you've got kids you're connecting them to their food in a way that they might not otherwise Mm -hmm. Uh, building these systems in schools is something that we're really passionate about Um, kids watching an ecosystem right in front of them and connecting them to the results of what happens if you mistreat one part of the ecosystem how that affects everything um, you know, these are all sort of intangible lessons that uh, I think are also need to be put into the equation. I, I absolutely agree. And, and I, I, the only reason I ask this question is because I know that people don't put it into the equation. And mm-hmm. I know even myself, like, you know, we're trying to, I'm trying to be as green as I possibly can be. But the reality is I am far from where I need to be in terms mm-hmm. of like, producing my own food and eating, even eating healthy in terms of diet and some of these things. I'm still young, but that's not, that's not an excuse for me. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think that's the first step that people need to overcome is that, yes, there are cheaper options out there. Yes, there is the ability to say, I can go to Walmart and buy this Chinese made tilapia, or I can buy this, this spinach that grew halfway around the world. And that's great. But what's even greater, what's even better for me is that I learn how to do it and I spend some time doing it and, and reaping the benefit of the real nutrients that we do need, that our bodies do need. Because I find it so ironic that there are people like, oh, well, we're saving money because I shop at Walmart and I buy all my food there. And it's not to hate on Walmart or corporations in, in general, but it is to say it's really funny when they're also at the pharmacy buying all of their supplement diet shakes and pills and all these things because they're, they feel unhealthy. Or they yeah. go to the doctor's office and they're like, oh, you're missing a lot of your, your daily calcium intake or your iron intake and all these things. And, or, or we're going to the gym to run on treadmills where all we really need to do is invest a little bit more time and energy into what we are eating and how we're eating it and how we're consuming it and where it's coming from. And I think if you do that, your mind enters this, this mental state um, where you will be truthfully healthier mm-hmm. just by the fact, even if you were eating the exact same portions of spinach grown by yourself and spinach grown locally in a store, I think that your mind, because you grew it yourself, will truthfully, your body will truthfully embody how much more nutrients and how much richer your life will be in terms of, of, of knowledge and of fulfillment in that, in that area and in that regard, that that is something that it has to be a part of the equation. It has well, to be a part of this equation. And people have to take into the full cost of, it's not just the, spin, the price of spinach on this shelf versus the price of spinach in your backyard. It is the cost of everything else that you do because you're unhealthy that also comes with buying the food off, off your, you know, off the shelf kind of thing. So well said. And, and the only thing that I would add to that, and it's, it's just a continuation of your thought stream, is when you're looking at the cost of something that you're buying that spinach from Walmart, think about the cost of the environment of all the transportation of that. Think about the cost of the, the plastics that were used to package it, Absolutely. right? I mean, Absolutely. The cost isn't just about the dollar that you're you know paying for that spinach, but all the costs that, that went along the way. Yeah, I, I think, I wonder at what point does that tip? At what point do we understand? Like, we all understand this. Everyone gets this. Even kids. I, I, do, I do speeches in school sometimes. And every time I mention, like, oh, we have to be greener and we have to care about our environment more. And, like, we really need to start thinking about this. Everyone's like, yes, I completely agree. 
why though is is there and this is the the question that plagues my life is why aren't we doing we all know this stuff it's like we all know that smoking is bad yet we smoke right we all know that eating unhealthy is bad yet we eat unhealthy and some people do it for, for taste some people do it because it's just convenience i think the number one thing that we have right now this is the battle of our this is the the, the trying times of today is that we're lazy mm-hmm. we're incredibly lazy and as you said earlier the detriment and the benefits and the detriments of the internet I would never have known about aquaponics had it not been because of the internet. At the same time, I could not be more confused about aquaponics because of the internet. Right. And needing that source of information that gets us off our couch, that gets us to stop being lazy, number one, not only for the planet as a whole, but for, for ourselves, is the biggest challenge. And this is why we invited you on the podcast today, because... We know, and I've gone through your site, and I haven't. We have your book here. It's actually it's on the land. It's not actually here in this house with me today. But um, going through that, I understand truthfully the difference between what needs to, what is happening today, and what needs to happen tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And I could not wish that tomorrow would come any sooner than it already is at times. And that's you know, it's it's a little bit of a sad reality. But that leads me to to one big question. Is this viable for the world? Is this the, is this the solution or part of the solution? Because there's no one solution. But how big of a part of the solution do you think aquaponics can be to changing our consumption of food and our consumption of, of not only just food, but the plastics and reducing all those things that go with it and transportation? How big of a solution is aquaponics in your mind? I mean, I, I, you must, I guess it's a bias, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> sure, of course I'm biased, but I also think I'm a realist. Um, I'm, I'm not going to tell you that aquaponics is the answer to our food problems because it's not. But here's what, there's two things that aquaponics does uniquely that I think make it a very important part of the future of food production. The first is that it's completely soil agnostic, mm-hmm. meaning I can set up an aquaponics system anywhere. So think about um, use uh, dilapidated warehouses in Detroit, right? Think about parking lots anywhere. Mm-hmm. You know, more and more in the past few years, um, I guess statisticians have figured out that over half the planet now lives in urban centers, right? Mm-hmm. We, we, we've hit this tipping point mm-hmm. as a species and we mostly live in urban centers. And yet, if we strictly rely on traditional agriculture, that can only take place in in fertile soil. Well, <laughs> no, yeah, right. the post keep, no, keep talking. Don't worry about it. Wants to participate in the conversation. <laughs> so, um, the so the fact that aquaponic systems can be done anywhere, you know, makes them a really important part of the localization of our food. Mm-hmm. The second thing that aquaponics does uniquely is grow fish in a way in a recirculating aquaculture system meaning we're not pulling more fish out of the ocean which is you know get me going for another hour on that but i mean just to to quickly just to quickly interject i'm sorry so sorry to cut you off on that people need to know about this very quickly we are overfishing to the point where i think what is it the stat it's like basically 90 percent of our fishing areas are completely overfished yeah. Like we're overfishing to the point, which means that like at some point we're going to run out of fish. It's like yeah. for every fish that is born, we're fishing two. So at some point... The this two statistics that I think are really important both came out of the United Nations. One of them is that approximately 70% of the fish in the ocean right now are endangered. Yeah. And the second statistic is if we continue to fish at the same rate as we're fishing right now, by 2048, we will have effectively drained the ocean of fish. There will be no more fish. That and because of the fact that we can't eat them, imagine what that's going to do to the ecosystem that makes up most of our planet, which is the oceans, right? That is amazing. So, that is unbelievably shocking. Pulling fish out of the ocean, um, it, unless we're doing it in a highly managed fashion, which, you know, like, the Alaskan fishery areas are highly managed and beautifully done, and mm. but most of the world's fisheries and, and oceans are not done as well as Alaska does theirs. So 
finding alternatives to that is really important. So we have to turn to farming our fish versus wild catching our fish. Farming definitely has its challenges. All of this, this off-coast net culture, you know, again, I could go on forever. But the bottom line is that has to be done better. And the better solution is recirculating aquaculture systems or tank culture, Mm -hmm. again, which has the benefit of being able to be set up anywhere close to these these urban centers. Um, But even that, waste management is the biggest issue that these aquaculture facilities have. They've been described as floating CAFOs or confined animal feedlots, right? They're producing all this waste that just gets dumped like a a toxic waste, just like a a cattle feedlot. Well, aquaponics has the answer to that. And and in my my simplistic view of the world, it just, I don't understand why in, you know, if, if not now, then 20 years from now, there would ever be an aquaculture facility set up that does not have a plant growing facility right next to it, right? Mm -hmm. Because the plants are processing that waste. They're taking, you know, in in my mind, the ultimate definition of a sustainable practice is taking what used to be the waste product from one system and making it a beneficial input into another system. So where, where aquaponics really shines is in taking something as important as the production of fish, because as a human species, we like our fish, you know, we like to eat fish. It's taking that process and actually creating organic produce out of it, as opposed to creating an environmentally toxic output that is fish waste. Mm -hmm. Based on that alone, I think that aquaponics is a tremendously important um, uh, way to grow both plants and fish and input into our our future global agriculture. I I mean, I couldn't agree more. needs to happen I, I i wonder how fast it will happen that's that's where the question is and, and i think i don't even want you to answer that i mean i'm sure you have your own answers i think that's what i want to leave viewers who are listening to this or watching this with is you guys can do this okay and i want to speak to you to the listeners on this you guys can do this you guys can learn about this you can visit sylvia's site you can, the aquaponic source uh, it's not the only site, but it is one of the best sites out there for information on this book and all this stuff. I absolutely need to to check this out. Um, she's got a Facebook page. I'll let you plug that real quick. Uh, our Facebook page is The Aquaponic Source, um, and it's, it's a pretty active page, but more importantly, we actually run a community site that's called The Aquaponic Gardening Community. Okay. Uh, and it's about 11,000 people there, and they're all um, really helping each other and talking about aquaponics. Um, nobody's worried about intellectual property on that site. They're all about sort of helping each other, answering questions. That's a great way to go, a great place to go. You can get to that off of our website by hitting the community tab or just type in aquaponicscommunity.com and you'll get to that site. Beautiful. Okay, well, look, I'm going to link all of this in the description for anybody who's looking for all of this stuff. Uh, links to her book on, on Amazon and stuff. I'm assuming it's on Amazon. It is on Amazon. Okay, great. Our website. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I got it off Amazon. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, first of all, thank you very much for, for sharing this knowledge, this wealth of knowledge. I mean, it couldn't be more timely for, for what Valhalla is doing, but also for, for the world. I mean, I think people really need to consider this. I mean, you know, people out there, young people out there are looking for jobs. They want to go in a field that's interesting to them. They believe in the green movement and, and being uh, more environmentally conscious and socially conscious in that sense. Here's your opportunity, guys. Here's one of the avenues that people could go into and check out. Um, it's 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 untapped in my mind. You know, there's there's tons of room for people to, to explore in this and to get paid to set up aquaponic systems and all this kind of stuff. So you guys really should look into it. Um, Again, thank you, Sylvia, for being on. And uh, well, look, hopefully we'll have you again soon. Great. I'd love it. And best of luck to you guys. And, you know, I'm here as a resource if you ever need anything. Absolutely. No, you know what? I was was thinking about this. And this is part of why we want to run these podcasts. We would love to have some of your products um, being used in our systems and then having that 
work together so that we can really try and have almost like a, a an aquaponics system that would be certified by you in a sense you know what i mean by by your knowledge and some of these things so that we can help spread what you do because you know we're not looking to be the necessarily the experts in this we're, we're not i'm not the expert in aquaponics and i and i don't think i ever will be because that's not what i do best but we're looking to bring the experts information to people at Valhalla so to create a common source for a lot of this information and to be able to link out and create them the network that is needed and the marketing that is needed behind all of this stuff so I mean I, you're gonna hear more about her and her products and her books and, and stuff in the future through our blogs and podcasts and all this stuff so uh, thank you very much for all listening and uh, if you guys want more information you guys can visit our site and you can visit ValhallaMovement.com we'll have all sorts of information there so, uh, so thanks again Thank you.